Good evening. Thank you for tuning in. This is a mayoral forum co-hosted by the Times Argus and Orca Media. I'm Steve Pappas of the Times Argus, and I will be serving as this evening's moderator. We are grateful for this opportunity to be part of the democratic process. Times Argus no longer provides political endorsements, a change in tradition that we imposed in 2020. Instead, we allow our focus to be getting to know the candidates and discussing the issues at play. With that in mind, we are pleased to be able to spend the next 90 minutes with you getting to know the three candidates on the ballot to be Montpelier's next mayor. All three candidates have a long history with the city. All three candidates are active in the city and all three have a vision for Montpelier. The candidates are Dan Jones, Jack McCullough, and Richard Shear. In a moment, we'll hear from them, but first, some housekeeping. This is a forum. It is not a debate. The candidates will not be addressing one another. They are here to explain what differentiates them from their contenders and to outline their thoughts on topics facing Montpelier. To be clear, the questions posed tonight are mine, and the candidates have not seen them in advance, probably to their dismay. Hopefully not. Each candidate will get two minutes to introduce themselves. Following those opening remarks, I will pose a series of questions. The candidates will get two minutes to respond, and I will rotate the order of the responders so that each candidate gets several chances to speak first. During the answers, I will signal you with 15 seconds to go. With a few minutes left in the forum, I will let the candidates make closing remarks, remarks <coughs> excuse me, again, two minutes each. And we are expecting a civil and respectful dialogue here tonight. I would remind viewers that this is being live streamed, but the forum will be available at orcamedia.net and likely will be broadcast now, between now and town meeting day on March 7th. So now, let's meet the candidates. As they appear on the ballot, our first candidate is Dan Jones. Two minutes, sir. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to the Times Argus and to Orca Media for sponsoring this needed public conversation. Now, I truly love our little city with its scenic valley, its uh, historic and beautiful downtown, and its kind of pervasive sense of community identity. And I'd like to help preserve as much of that as possible. My work for several years has been to create a sustainable Montpelier, capable of responding to the economic, climate, and social disruptions that are clearly coming our way. Today, we can see those challenges have arrived or are visible on the horizon. Workforce housing is a huge issue. Teachers, healthcare workers, and all the other people who depend, we depend on every day need affordable places to live. We've been falling, failing them. And I will focus on how our city can help support a rapid creation of more workforce housing. We cannot have a sustainable city without clean water. A quarter century of deferred maintenance has led to its increasing fragility of our infrastructure. We must make sure that the system starts to comply with recognized norms and the state demand for long-term safe operations. Our property taxes are moving from an annoyance to a financial threat for many of our citizens. We must focus on our budget priorities and look hard at the areas of our current expenditures. We face climate disruptions and growing recession, and I want to make sure the city is preparing for a wide range of predictable disruptions. Together, we can build a resilient and a safe future here but we must do so in recognition of hard choices. As mayor, I hope to provide the needed leadership so that our wonderful little city can adapt and prosper in these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jack McCullough. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to Orca and the Times Argus for hosting this debate, or forum, sorry. Um, you may catch us disagreeing with each other once or twice, though. Um, my wife and I moved here to Montpelier in 1983 uh, to raise a family, and we found this to be just a great place to live. In fact, many people have heard me say that uh, Montpelier is the best place in all of Vermont to live. I, I truly believe that. Uh, the sense of community, the, uh, 
the commitment of our residents and our neighbors to the well-being of, of the town and uh, the natural and cultural resources that we have all make this a, a wonderful place to live, to raise a family, as my wife and I have raised our two sons, uh, one of whom uh, still lives in Montpelier with his wife and uh, our two granddaughters. So like, uh, like Dan, I, I love this city and uh, I, I love being in it. I've spent my life in public service from 43 years as a legal aid lawyer, first in Michigan, and uh, since 1983 here in Vermont, to uh, the time I've spent serving as chair of the Montpelier Housing Task Force, the serving on the uh, board and as chair of the Montpelier Housing Authority, working as a justice of the peace, a member of the Board of Civil Authority, for over two decades, for serving on the city council for the last five years. And I hope to use my knowledge, my experience, and my leadership ability to continue serving the city. Thank you. Richard Shear. I am Richard Shear. And instead of thanking the Times Argus, I'd like to thank you for watching and tuning into this and engaging in the process. Uh, right now, Montpelier is at an inflection point. And I think all of you are somewhat familiar with Alice in Wonderland. And the pivotal point in that is when Alice is walking down the path and in the middle is a very large mushroom and the path veers off in many different directions and sitting atop the mushroom is a caterpillar. And Alice asks the caterpillar, which way should I go? And the caterpillar serenely looks at her and responds, it very much depends on where you wish to go where you wish to end up. We're at a point right now where you need to choose a path. And three paths that are distinctly different are going to be offered tonight. Now, they're not opposing paths. They're parallel paths. And they're being presented by two different people who I've known for a long time who are very able people and civic people. But you're going to have to choose a path, one of three paths. It might not be mine. It might be Dan's. It might be Jack's. But standing still is, and doing nothing and not voting is not really an option. For the next 90 minutes, you're going to find this extremely informative and, I believe, entertaining. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, let's hop right into some discussion of some of the bigger issues going on. Um, we're going to start with... Um, Jack on this one. How should Montpelier grow its tax base? Excellent question. Since uh, the time I've been here, I've, uh, for years I've been aware of the, uh, of the population in Montpelier and the population in Montpelier is just about or even a little less than it was a hundred years ago. And uh, during that time a lot of things have changed our population has not been able to grow to, uh, to sustain those changes. And, uh, but what has grown is the number of households. The biggest challenge facing Montpelier is the lack of housing. People need housing to live here. There are large employers who can't hire people because they, uh, they can't find a place to live. And there are low wage workers who can't afford to live here because the housing is too low. So that's one of our major challenges. Another major challenge is that uh, the downtown is healthy. It's sort of making it, but uh, it's, it needs help. Um, one of our, the big things that's come up lately is uh, city, uh, state government has to decide what it's going to do. I would like to see the, the state workers come back to their offices, but I don't think it's going to come back the way uh, they always were. So I think we need to lean on the state to tell them, well, okay, if you're not going to have your workers come back into town, do something else productive with the land. But we, are, we have done, done good work in Montpelier. For instance, the, uh, the Caledonia Spirits, which uh, I wasn't really a fan of when... Uh, when we uh, had them come in has been a tremendous uh, benefit to the city. There are other opportunities that, uh, that we can pursue. Great, thank you. 
Richard, how do we grow Montpelier's tax base? It's an interesting question, and a question that really is not Montpelier specific. Uh, it's not Vermont specific. It's, it's communities all across the country. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to recognize that we are a small town of 7,500. Uh, some of this is well beyond, in, in terms of growing our tax base, some of it's beyond us. Making sure that our schools are quality is what grows our base. It helps to grow our base. Um, I would add, of course, uh, pilot, which is the amount that the state pays to us for having the state office buildings. But that's something that every mayor has said for years and years, we'd like to see the rate increased. Uh, and they go to our delegation, and our delegation does what it can do. But that's part of the puzzle. Um, in terms of growing Montpelier, we really have to pay attention to our tax rate. And we have to pay attention to our infrastructure, uh, simply because seeing our roads in disrepair does not attract people to our community, or businesses for that matter. Great. Thank you. Dan, your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> growing would be an uh, interesting prospect. I've been talking with people all over town, and I'm actually hearing a new attitude on our property tax demands. People a couple of years ago used to think that the taxes were a nuisance, but now they're finding them financially threatening. In creating the tax plans, our administration seems to have forgotten that the same inflation that is driving up the cost of the city is also hammering our city's, citizens' daily budgets. Our downtown businesses are certainly feeling a shrinking um, revenues. Okay, so we need an immediate analysis of the city's growing tax burden in a ways of managing the proposed tax increases. While we wait for reappraisal findings, we can only hope that a large number of our current properties can be reassessed in something approaching their actual worth. I believe that we need a hard look at the commercial buildings on State Street as they are appraised at something like a third of their real value. Now, of course, the business people who own those uh, properties are hurting with the post-COVID collapse of office demand. So we need to start working on ways of turning those properties into other uses, like housing. Before our residents are hammered with the ever-growing tax burden, we need to deep dive into the various ways which our buildings and land are valued now. And this is where we kind of have to get into a systems analysis, looking at the multiple factors. For instance, how much of our single-family housing is owned by investors you know, or non-residents with little commitment to our community? Personally, I'd like to see such investment houses taxed substantially higher than the owner-occupied dwellings, though that would need some provision that the taxes could not be passed on to uh, the renters. So we need to take a look at the actual expense base of our city, our government, and see where savings can be created. And such demands will demand a citywide discussion of our real priorities and would assume a justification for all our costs and administrative budgets. Great. Thank you. Richard, this, first, this next question is going to start with you. What needs updating in our city's master plan? I believe that what needs updating in our city's master plan is management of uh, the management responsibility of city council and the oversight that city council has in terms of the city manager and the master plan in its implementation is what's important. It's not the vision itself, it's how the vision is implemented that's really important. And accountability in implementation is extremely important, and that involves oversight, which is one of the principal functions of the mayor. I mean, in Montpelier, the mayor, according to the charter, does very little. They can't, as Jack knows, they can't even vote unless there's a tie to be broken. Uh, they set the agenda, and they're the people who chair the meetings. Their key function is oversight over management and how management does implement things such as the master plan and things that aren't in the master plan, the daily operation of our city, police, fire, public works, uh, recreation, all of those. Great. Thank you. Dan, what needs to happen to our master plan? 
Well, first of all, we need one. Uh, other than redrawing some lines on a map five years ago, uh, we're really working with a master plan that's 10 years old and doesn't take into account a lot of changes that have happened in the city. So um, we are still operating with an idea that we have a growing economy rather than a flattening economy. We're still operating on the idea that somehow we are the center of a um, c uh, commuter base for the region and uh, dedicate 60, 65% of our downtown to uh, uh, parking lots. Now, I'm tired of parking lots. We've got, we've got to start thinking about other uses for our downtown land, but that requires a master plan that has a broader way of looking at it. Another one that I'm really, really worried about is that our master plan doesn't take into account a lot of the things that we can see happening in the climate and the economy that is foreseeable now. Um, the same way that this winter is suddenly turning into be an extended mud season, you know, with uh, inter intervals of deep cold and then going back to, well, it's 52 degrees today. I mean, this is mid-February. Uh, so we have to start accounting for what that's going to mean for our infrastructure, what's that going to mean for uh, you know, our environment, our economy, because uh, we're no longer a winter sports economy, as this opinion uh, goes on. Uh, what's it going to mean in the summertime if we have one of those uh, heat domes that comes over us? We're done from planning for floods, but we've done no planning for uh, the other kinds of uh, disruptions we may have to see. And so I think it's time for us to really, as a council, you know, and I agree with Richard on the, the role of this, to start demanding a new level of planning from our uh, planning department and a master plan that re better reflects the coming realities. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that means Jack disagrees with you or. He needs, he needs water. But <laughs> Sorry about that, Jack. That's okay. Um, Jack, what do you think? The, uh, the planning commission is engaged in a process of revising the master plan and what they've been doing is you know meeting with the relevant uh, city committees to address each element of the master plan for instance we have a housing committee and before that the housing task force and we spent a good bit of time working with the uh, with the planning department to give our insight into the uh, master plan. I was served on the Man Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Similarly, we gave input uh, into that. And every part of the city uh, is doing the same thing. Then it will come to the Planning Commission. Then it will come to the City Council. As it, it's no surprise to hear that I think that one of our pressing needs is housing and Figuring out how we can develop more housing for the people who need to be here is, uh, is one of the important things we have to re recognize. Transportation is another major issue because uh, even with the things we've done uh, to improve our transportation system in, in Montpelier, we will uh, need to continue modernizing that and uh, working on meeting the needs of uh, of our residents. I hope we'll have a growing population in coming years and we need to address those needs. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, this next question is gonna start with you and uh, Richard alluded to it. What needs to change before the next time the city negotiates with the state over the pilot? See, I'm trying not to be uh, cynical on this one, but I think we need to grow some backbone for the city. I think this has to be an issue that has to be confronted in more ways than just uh, saying, oh, well, this is traditionally what cities get for pilot uh, payments, and that's, uh, you know, because I asked uh, Ann Watson this question a couple of days ago, and that's what she said, oh, we're traditionally in that frame. So I think we have to start looking at uh, what we are as a regional entity, not just as a city, because the state is uh, using us as a centerpiece, okay, a place will come in, which is like I said, we have 65% six, uh, of our downtown is parking lot. Okay, that means a commuter base that is assumed to come from a region, not from just Montpelier. And yet a huge portion of our actual downtown land is devoted to the uh, 
states' government uh, offices. So in that respect, uh, we've got to start making a new argument with the state that uh, there's really a lot of demands. And some of it can be increased pilot payments. Some of it could be some of that land along the river that is not going to be reused as people uh, continue working at home for being able to make it available for housing. Uh, we can find other ways of working things. But we also have to start limiting, perhaps, what we're offering the state. You know, maybe the, the police department has to be, doesn't have to be available for every time the state wants to call. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that we can use to sort of leverage our position. Great. Jack, what do we have to do to renegotiate, before we renegotiate pilot? Well, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> we have to recognize that Montpelier is not uh, a lone ranger here. We're not, we're not a, a solar player in, a solo player in the uh, payment in lieu of taxes world. There are plenty of towns in the state or cities in the state that uh, have a lot of uh, state property and they all participate in pilot. We're, we're, we don't get to set the rate, we don't get to set, to set the price. It's the legislature that does that. And uh, we will be, we have been and will continue to be working with the other uh, municipalities that have large amounts of uh, state property to push in the legislature for a, a bigger allocation of, of pilot money. I think that uh, it's a very tricky thing because what we're supposed to be doing is uh, assessing all the state property based on its fair market value. We can all come up with a reasonable assessment of what the fair market value of a state office building is. A little trickier to decide what the fair market value of a state house is. There's only one of them and there's not that many buyers for it. So there's, <clears throat> there's a lot involved. I would continue to push hard for, uh, for increased allocation. In uh, just the last couple of years, the uh, city council has uh, formed a legislative committee to uh, set our priorities for what we want to lobby for in the state house. And uh, as I say, I think it's, it's the first time we're working closely with uh, with our legislative with our legislative delegation, and we'll continue to do that. Richard, what do you think? I'm going to go in a different direction. Uh, years ago, I was a member of the Parking Committee, uh, and um, Governor Shumlin's aide was the chair of that, Michael Clausen. And we went off in very creative directions in those days. We were talking about land swap, and we were talking about a possible parking garage that would be next to the executive build, uh, building, the, ex the uh, pavilion we were talking about. Uh, at the time, the wood chip plant was coming, the uh, district heat, and we negotiated to be able to put that on state land. Um, the car lot, which became the transit center, was another one where the state and the city were being creative. The state has land that we find could be of interest Pilot should be thought of in a broader context. Maybe there's land that uh, next to the Department of Labor where the liquor authority is that could become a new state office complex of some sort, a small one, so that we grow the number of workers in Montpelier that are on state jobs. That's not pilot per se, but it's the same sort of thing that is win-win. We have something you want, you have something we want, and we can sit and make something happen. Because Jack is totally right on that. We're not alone. Waterbury is, is principally along with us. But there are a lot of cities and towns that are along with us on that one. That one's largely out of our control. Well, this next issue, again, something that was just brought up, um, is not out of your control. Um, and we'll start with Jack on this one. In your opinion, has the district heat plant been worth it? It's, uh, it, it's been a problematic uh, issue for us. I, I was a strong supporter of District Heat when, when it was proposed uh, way before I was ever on the council. One of the things that we were really hoping to do is, has been successful, and that is to uh, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. However, we know that uh, our customers are not happy with the uh, with the prices they're paying for 
for heat. So the jury's still out. I think we will still, in the long run, consider it to have been worth it. But I think that uh, <clears throat> the long run is the way we have to look at a lot of issues. Meanwhile, one of the things that we put in this year's proposed budget that I hope the uh, I hope that voters support the budget in general. One of the things we put in was some financial incentives to attract more uh, more customers to the system, and that is a way of uh, spreading the cost. Great, thank you, Richard. I was opposed to district heat. The numbers didn't make sense to me at the time, but I was not. You know, I'm a citizen and. It didn't get my vote, but I was not open saying, hey, we shouldn't do District 8. What concerned me about District 8 is, I think most of you know that my wife has a downtown business. That was a disaster in terms of construction. The merchants were promised that that would end in August before leaf season. It ended in November. And that was the beginning of the key, the clues, that something was dearly wrong under those streets with sewer and water. And let's not forget that it went down State Street, uh, down School Street over to that school, the same path that we worked on recently. And basically, it was sending red flags all over the place that we didn't understand the downtown infrastructure under the streets, and we missed those flags. The council at that point just did not act on it as they probably should have, and had they acted on it, our system would have been fully mapped right now in terms of the downtown, not only the location, but the condition of those pipes. And this last console would have been able to take intelligent action so that you didn't have whack-a-mole water leaks downtown. So yeah, that's what District 8 meant to me. It was the indication that something was wrong and we didn't act on it. Dan, what do you think? Was it worth it? It could be. Okay, I, I was a strong proponent of District Heat at the time. I was on the Energy Committee, and um, I've been very disappointed with the city's management of it, okay, or lack of management. I, because uh, I was then becoming an interface with the businesses that had signed up for District Heat and found that they were not getting the support they needed uh, for figuring out the problems. So there was this handoff bo box at the District Heat plant where the steam heat for the buildings becomes uh, hot water for the city. Um, it was supposed to be then metered and managed and that nobody was actually assigned the job of overseeing it. It should have been created in some kind of a utility function that there was actually management and oversight rather than being stuck with the city engineer to say, here you do it. So that meant if you did something like I was uh, with the Unitarian Church trying to say, well, could we use this or heat to heat the church? And it turned out the city wanted $200,000 to make a pipe connection across the street. And it said, well, wait a minute. There's no bonding authority within the city that allows for uh, this to be spread out over 20 years. No, it had to be paid now. So it's been poorly managed, poorly overseen by the city. It's become something that I think could be resurrected because the energy costs in general are going to be going up for everyone. We've already started seeing it. They, you know, they go this way, but they keep going up higher. So the district heat plant could become the salvation of our downtown because it could become a very cost-effective way of keeping things heated in the future. But that's going to require a management plan and a utility pro uh, approach that is sadly lacking from the current administration. Great. You guys are n nailing the time. Nicely done. Um, so on kind of on the uh, same vein, um, we've now set the stage. Um, Richard, I'm going to start with you. What policy decisions do you think need to be made today that are going to help Montpelier a decade from now? There's two of them that, that I feel. One is that for years we've kicked the can down the road in terms of finding out what is going on under those streets. I mean, the number of water main breaks just in the last month, we had behind Positive Pie in the parking lot. We had in front of TD Bank on, State, on Main Street. We had College Avenue, we had Langdon Street, uh, all in a matter of a month. This is telling us that that 50-year-old plan, or the 50-year plan that we have, is invalid. And the main decision that we need to make is who is going to do this? Should we bring in outside sewer water experts, 
or should we allow the city manager and public works to do that? And what I'm saying is I would advise that we bring in authorities with more expertise than we have in-house to make that determination and that it be done in six months' time so that we, before that next budget, have an idea of what this looks like in the short term and the medium term so that we can adjust the long-term capital budget. And with the Elks Club, same. In six months, we need a solid business plan that will tell us who's going to pay for the water and sewer underneath that. And at that point, council will make a decision either to continue with it or to sell the property and put it back downtown into under the streets. That's what I believe needs to be done right now. Dan, what do you think needs to be decided now for a decade out? Okay, I will start in agreeing with Richard on the uh, water system. I think we don't have a si functioning city without clean water, and I think the can has been kicked down the road for 25 years. Uh, so we actually have to have a plan that is going to deal with that, whether it's uh, internally or not. I think the state has yet to fully uh, weigh in on whether what we've got is a pressure problem or a pipe problem and I'm beginning to fall on the side of a pressure problem. But that's going to require $50 million or so in terms of pipes and the things. So the city's going to have to find a way of paying for that. The other thing that we're going to have to do, I think, is start imagining a um, new tax structure that begins to look at, like I suggested before, um, other ways of valuation of properties so that uh, we're not having our workers um, driven out by uh, investor-owned buildings. Uh, that means a new kind of attention to zoning so that the zoning is the main lever the city has. You know, but how do we then use that lever to uh, do things like get housing up here at uh, VCFA? How do we get uh, housing going in places that uh, it might be needed immediately? Because without the housing, we then have a problem with about well-to-do people wondering where they're going to find carpenters and plumbers and teachers. So we have yet to uh, figure out that workforce housing issue. And finally, like I said, I think we've got to uh, really start taking a much harder look at our uh, administrative costs and overhead and say, what is it that we need to uh, approach and control because we are not in a never-ending growth spiral now. And so we're going to have to learn how to contract and manage with it. Okay. You've still got 10 seconds. <laughs> Why thank you, Steve? <laughs> but now you don't. Jack, what, what needs to happen now? Well, one thing you've heard from me before, and what we hear from everybody in the city, is what we need is housing. What we don't hear as much of is how do we make sure we get it. And so what I, what I think we need to do, one of the things we really need to do is address the issue of housing where we're going to put it, how we're going to uh, develop more housing. I think, and there's been economic studies that shown that, that we could, uh, over time, we could in increase our population by a couple of thousand, go up to about 10,000, and it would not appreciably change what we see of as the quality of, see as the quality of life we live in, Mon we have in Montpelier, and it would be uh, economically beneficial. Um, we're, we're doing that right now. We're involved in a public process to address how we're going to deal with uh, the Country Club Road property. And the, the voters came out and supported the purchase for housing, for uh, land conservation, and for recreation. We have major needs in housing and also recreation. And so bringing that to a successful conclusion is going to be a, a major uh, major benefit. Another part of it is how do we get housing into downtown? You know, one of the things that I'm going to want to do as mayor is uh, approach the owners of downtown businesses. We've got a lot of, uh, we still have upper floors downtown that, uh, that could support uh, great housing the way we did with the French block. There are other areas we've seen proposals like uh, the Habitat for Humanity proposal which is walkable to downtown. We need to do more of that. Great. Thank you. Dan, um, some elderly friends are stopping into town. Mm -hmm. 
Richard? Oh. No, I opened up. Oh, you, I started. Started. you started. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no. Okay. Some elderly friends are stopping in the town. Please point them to the restroom. In the 21st century, why is this an issue in a progressive city like Montpelier? That's either a very short or a very uh, long answer. Uh, I'll, you have two uh, minutes. Uh, I'll have two <laughs> minutes. Um, I noticed that the uh, legislature is taking the bull by the horn and now has a bill to study whether there should be a public restroom in town supported by the state. Um, I think it's an uh, embarrassment for our city that there is not public restrooms available at all hours for a place that prides itself on being the center of the state and the uh, center of the state. Uh, yeah. But that is uh, one of the problems that we keep throwing down the road uh, that uh, can't kicking down the road. Now there are ways that we could do things rather rapidly, but it might mean be less pretty, but uh, could be effective. You know, there could be porta potties put in rather rapidly and uh, supported. Um, but no, nobody seems to mention that. They want some kind of a, a finished thing. They're, they're, but there's no budget, so who's going to clean it, et cetera. It becomes one of those things that there's, oh, we can't do this and we can't do this. It's sort of like uh, Tr Harry Truman used to complain that uh, he wanted a one-handed economist because uh, each economist would say, well, on one hand you can do this, on the other hand you can do this, but nobody ever makes a decision. And I fear that we're in that situation. The city, the city could pull the bulls by the horn uh, and try and find ways of actually constructing something using land that it's in control of downtown, but it hasn't. Okay, it's waiting for the state. The state is got to, uh, going to study it, so it's two years out before it does anything. Uh, this is an embarrassment, but what do I tell my elderly friends? Well, I said, well, uh, City Hall until four in the afternoon, uh, you know, one of the restaurants if they let you in without having to buy something, or uh, the transit center until seven at night. But uh, other than that, we're up. Jack, you've been wrestling with this one. We have. We need uh, downtown restrooms. Um, there are, uh, the city has, uh, been working to address that, this not as quickly as we should because we're deal we're addressing a couple of different populations, people who don't have any place else to live and people who are visiting. And uh, this is a major uh, des travel destination. We should have it. We should. Uh, 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 last year, uh, maybe two years ago, the voters of the city approved a four hundred fifty thousand dollar appropriation for. Uh, services for uh, homeless people, including a building to uh, site uh, public restrooms. Um, the siting is very difficult because a lot of the parts right down are also, guess what, in the flood zone. So that's, uh, that's, that's a real challenge. We're going to continue to work on it. Uh, we support the, uh, the bill that uh, Connor Casey, our former counselor, and Kate McCann have uh, sponsored in, uh, in the legislature. Um, a couple of years ago, we did have porta potties, and I think that as a temporary fix, we uh, we should still be doing that. And um, but but we need to keep working on it. Meanwhile, city hall, police department, transit center, um, those are resources that are available to people. Great, Richard. Well, that's one that my wife faces because she sees elderly people come into the quirky pet all the time with that kind of request. She sends them over to City Hall. Uh, she used to send them over to the Civic Center, but that is no longer viable. Um, that is a real issue. Uh, Jack nailed it. There are two very distinctly different populations that would be using that if it were available during commercial hours and the like. Um, I think there's a broad community consensus on this. When it goes 24 hours, then you end up with the issue of how do we secure this facility so that it's not vandalized. And basically, those are really tough issues before council, and council really has worked hard on that. Um, but I'll add one more. There should be a drinking fountain in front of City Hall so that you can get water for free in downtown Montpelier, and it should have a little thing below for dogs. <laughs> Great. So, sorry, you, you all set? 
I didn't mean to cut you off. You actually had more time. No. Okay, you're all set. I'll leave it with Okay. Um, so, Jack, we're going to start with you on this one. Um, given the fact that Montpelier has been struggling with um, the issue of public access, homelessness, my question is, how do you think other communities see Montpelier right now? I don't really know. I think that uh, one thing that uh, other communities are thinking is that uh, they're glad it's not us and them, and not, it's us and not them, because I think that uh, what we've done, uh, the services we've provided for our uh, homeless community members have been uh, more than what most other communities have done, and, uh, and more than what other uh, communities, frankly, would have the capacity to do. And just in the last couple of years, we've, uh, we've provided uh, funding for the uh, Good Samaritan Haven to uh, increase their, uh, their capacity. We have uh, added funding to, uh, to the police to, uh, for a social worker and uh, shared with the city of Barrie and, uh, and a peer advocate. And uh, we are doing, I think, what is in the capacity of the city of Montpelier to do. We cannot end homelessness with the resources of the city of Montpelier. However, we do have an obligation to uh, provide what assistance we can to enable people to have a, a reasonable, uh, live in, in reasonable dignity and safety. We have to recognize that being homeless is not something that those members of our community are doing to us. They're not doing it to the city. They're uh, victims of circumstance, of whatever might have happened to them in the past, and, but that doesn't mean we have no uh, obligations to them. Thank you. Richard. Homelessness is a really difficult issue. It's, I don't like that term, actually, or unhomed. I don't like that term either because it, it, it bunches together two very, very separate populations. One are victims of circumstance who've lost their jobs or whatever. They're people who work and people who are unemployed looking for work. And on the other side, it bunches together people who basically conduct a lifestyle of begging, of intoxication, of, and who don't want to work. And I think that there's a core value in this town that we need to be cognizant of, that we, we all share, and that's the dignity of work. And when you subsidize and when you encourage people, able-bodied adults, to shirk work, you're not helping these people to reach their full human potential. And in a lot of ways, that's insulting to those of us on the lowest part of the labor market those people who are working those jobs for low hours, low pay, and who are trying to sit and build their way up. And when you're talking about helping those who've lost their jobs, those who want to step up and join our community in a meaningful way, I think that that's something we can agree on. Where we disagree is empowering people whose lifestyle is, is a handout and begging. And that is not a shared community value. For people who want to contribute to those people, fine. But that's not a shared responsibility of the city, in my opinion. Dan, how do you think Montpelier was perceived on these issues? Well, thank goodness we're stuck with it, not them, I think is, uh, at least for central Vermont, that would be probably the uh, way it, uh, it looked, you know, uh, because you're the city and you're stuck with it. Um, I actually think, uh, and I admire what we've been doing so far. I, I'm friends with Dick, Rick DeAngelis, who uh, runs Good Samaritan, who uh, says the city has been remarkably supportive of the homeless uh, population. and. Uh, my friend Ken Russell, who uh, runs Another Way and is in charge of the Homeless Task Force, is uh, the same thing. They're, these are noble people trying their best to do what they can within a uh, difficult circumstance. 
And like I said, I think there's a lot of the, uh, we're, we're getting, because we're the center of uh, central Vermont, we're the downtown, a lot of people who might be out of work from the hinterlands, from the surrounding things, come into town because here's where you might get services, here's where you might get food. So we're basically the repository for not just Montpelier, but for the whole region. And I think the, the rest of the region is quite happy that we're stuck with it. Um, now, I will disagree on one thing because I think our homeless situation now is not unlike with the Depression, and I think we're, we're going toward a worse situation where there were tons and tons of people who were called bums, okay, or said they didn't want to work, and they were riding the rails looking for jobs in different places. They were on migrant camps like in Grapes of Wrath. Um, and we're now facing another situation where a large number of people are in that thing. We have a housing emergency. We can't find places uh, for the workforce to house. So we have nurses living out of cars. We have people who should be housed. Not. So it's a failure of the social system, of the nimbyism in town. Uh, and like I said, we're, uh, you know, it's also a failure of our legislature because they allow this to happen. And I think uh, that's a big failure that we should have. The legislature should be supporting us in this effort uh, in all sorts of ways, and they're failing at it. Richard, I'm going to start with you on this question. Um, as we've seen, municipal budgets keep growing. Um, revenue, one way or another, comes out of every wallet of every voter who's going to decide who's going to be mayor. Um, for you, what's the trigger that's going to signal enough? That's a really, uh, Dan was visiting that earlier and saying that that's an individual household decision. Uh, in terms of us, I've actually gone in and studied that budget, and it's a fairly tight budget. It's, you know, um, there aren't that many new staff positions that have been created in the last four years. In the last four years, we have two new people in the Department of Public Works. Um, it's, it's a difficult, very, very difficult budget to sit and slice at because where you decide to slice, you have a constituency that's going to say, I'm getting gored. Uh, let's not forget that the mayor is one vote out of seven, and one vote that doesn't even vote unless it's tied. Uh, for me, in terms of the budget, I think right now people are feeling it. That's what I'm hearing, is that the budget concerns them. And what's embedded beneath the budget concerns them. Um, Jack was talking about the recreation center, and that's a good topic to discuss. What people are concerned about isn't necessarily the building of a recreation center. How are we going to staff that building? What is sitting as a Trojan horse in that proposal? They're not so much worried about the housing and, and Cotton Club at the Elks Club. They're worried about the streets, the sewers, the lights, the ancillary in that, what's hidden in that proposal. They feel like the budget isn't really transparent. That's what's concerning to people. And the budget hearing was four and a half hours. Right now in Orca, 100 people have watched it. So really, people aren't really understanding the budget. It's very, very complex, and it's not being explained well. Dan? A question again, if you would, please. Municipal budgets keep growing. Revenue, one way or another, comes out of every wallet of every voter in Montpelier. For you, what's the trigger that is going to signal enough? Like I said, what I'm hearing around town is that uh, the trigger is actually the confluence of the inflation, the demands in other parts of people's lives, along with the tax bill. The tax bill is now considered an imposition and threatening, uh, which it hasn't been in the past. Now, I believe there's actually been a lot of additions to the city government, you know, whether it's assistant city manager, whether it's a communications director, whether it is uh, this task or that task. And I think we have to take a hard look at what are we doing with the money, what do we have to do with the money. And this is something that is difficult for any city because all of these things have been added in a period of growth. We're no longer in a period of growth. And that means that we're going to start seeing a winnowing away, a wearing away of what's uh, available for this. And so we're going to have to make hard decisions. Now, what's the trigger point? 
I think we're reaching it. Okay, I, I think there's a lot of anger out there. And so it's going to require us to do things with the, the, the budget that are uncomfortable. It's going to mean uh, getting rid of staff that is going to be uncomfortable because it's going to be harder next year than it is this year. Because the inflation is not driven by monetary policy. The inflation is driven by a lot of stuff that's a lot more expensive in resources and stuff than uh, it was before. It's going to keep going up. So is the price of uh, fuel. So is the price of housing. So unless we start understanding that pe real people are getting hurt and do not have the capacity to do this, we're not going to be able to go forward. And then we have the huge costs that we haven't even talked about of the water system. So the water system is going to be a huge drain. And once people realize how expensive that's going to be to fix, it's going to be through the roof with the anger. Jack, what's enough? As we started working on our budget this past uh, year in uh, either December or January. I think I, December is when I made this point. My opening statement for the, uh, for the budget discussion was that uh, our city staff really has its hand full, hands full with a lot of uh, projects and initiatives that uh, the voters of Montpelier have, uh, have approved over the recent years. By the same token, we're at, we were asking the uh, voters to uh, to dig into their pockets and and pay a lot based on the uh, projects that they've uh, already adopted. So my my starting point from anything in the budget was that I think we need to continue funding the initiatives that we're uh, committed to, but that uh, we were not going to be. Uh, adding anything new, and any new projects, any new uh, initiatives of, or plans of any kind. And, and we've stuck to that. And uh, I think it's an important thing to recognize that the uh, city council does listen to the voters. We do work to uh, balance two important considerations. One is, what are the uh, city services that, uh, that people get and need and rely on. And it's, it's my opinion, not just from talking pe to people, but also from uh, looking at the election returns, that people value the municipal services that they get from, from a very well and professionally run city government. Our, uh, by the same token, our tax increase this year, for, for taking the last two years, our municipal tax rate is up. 3.3%, 1.65% for each of the last two years uh, taken together. That's not going to choke a horse. Well, we'll see. Um, so on this next question, we're going to start with Dan. Um, tell us your thoughts on Montpelier's current demographics and what you see as the challenges within them. We're old. Um, we're, uh, you know, we've got too many uh, of us in the senior category and not enough of us uh, coming up with uh, the uh, skills and energy that are going to be needed to uh, build our future. Um, nor uh, do we have um, enough of us to uh, the young people coming up who are really going to be able to take over lots of the uh, resources in town because right now, because us old people are living so long, okay, we're, um, a lot of us are sitting in houses that are way beyond what we need, but the, uh, you know, we would like to move to smaller places, but it turns out there aren't any to move into, so we have a lot of housing space that could be divided up being uh, captured that way. We're also, um, we've been rich too long, so we've assumed that we um, have the capacity to do things that are beginning to be patently um, not possible. So, uh, you know, we've got a lot of well-to-do people who uh, may be threatened as uh, the economic challenges come uh, around. Um, we've got um, 
we've got to structure the city too much for the needs of the old, and uh, while we have great recreation facilities, they're underutilized in many respects because we don't have the, uh, the actual demand in the population for them. So I think it's time for us to start looking at ways that we can even things out, and that's going to require some hard choices for uh, people that I don't think are uh, ready to talk about yet. Jack, how are our demographics in Montpelier right now? Well, as a fellow art old guy, it's hard to argue with Dan. On the other hand, uh, <laughs> on, on the other hand, I am going to take issue with that. Certainly, we have a disproportionate uh, number of uh, older older people in the population. But I'm seeing from from where I sit, and mostly because of uh, being involved with my uh, my grandchildren and and their families, I see. A lot of younger people who are still moving to Montpelier, establishing households in Montpelier, raising children in Montpelier, and I think that's going to continue. That's something we really need to address. Um, I'll, I'll go back to it again. Housing. We need more housing for young people. You know, it's not old people who are working in restaurants. It's not old people who are working in the uh, retail stores for the most part. We need housing that younger people can afford and can move into. Um, we do need uh, recreation resources. We, um, I'm seeing young people, young adults, in many of the uh, of the city committees that I've worked on, and I think that's a good thing. I think we need to uh, continue to address that and, and really make more of an effort than we have to attract younger community members to get involved with things that might not be that interesting to them. Do them right, right. They might not think they're interested in, like planning commission, uh, development review board, all things like that that really keep the uh, keep the city running. And I think we can do it because I think that there are people who want to make their homes there and their future here and their future here, and so they will uh, will step up and participate. Richard, boy, that, that's I'm the third old guy, unless you include you. There's four. No, of I'm us. four of us, but. Um, that's an interesting challenge, particularly we're in the middle of a reappraisal right now. All of our houses are going to be reappraised up. Housing is 30% of your income, supposed to be 30% of your income. My concern is when Jack creates housing, Dan, I create, anybody creates housing, it's going to be at a, at a market value. And that market value right now at 30% of 350,000 or whatever the mean house is right now in this town requires a double income that's middle class. I am more worried about this becoming a gated community uh, of its own accord, not, not simply because we put a gate here and say that only people who are you know, either old and, and have bought in early. I'm concerned about those young people being able to buy into the new homes that we would be constructing. One thing about the demographic that I do am heartened by is the subcontinent population that's here now uh, from India uh, that's emerged in the town that I think is a great asset. I think these are just absolutely great people uh, in the civic sense and diversifies the community, but we're not seeing growth in the schools right now. It's, it's totally flat as it's been and that is seriously concerning. So you have a school system that's totally flat combined with not being able to afford a house unless you're selling a house and moving in from another community. That does not bode well, and there's nothing that the three of us can realistically do about that. I didn't use before, just for, for, for an interesting demographic fact. Do it. The Census Bureau de uh, defines Montpelier as a NORC, an N-O-R-K, a naturally occurring retirement community. Wow. Well, on that note. Um, so your positions on Country Club Road property and infrastructure are out there. there uh, there's actually a nice piece in the bridge. I'll give the bridge a shout out this, this, time, this time around. One of those um, projects is very internal. The other is very external. And I want, starting with Jack, you all to explain why one has to be the priority. 
I think that we need to do two things here. Uh, we need to, uh, I, th I think we're going to come up with something, with a proposal that's not going to be any one of the three models that we've been shown. But I think what we are going to see is something that, uh, that has a significant amount of housing, uh, possibly and probably more than what uh, was described as the, as the middle range, the, the hybrid between housing and uh, recreation. Probably more housing than that. Um, and, but I, I do think we also have an obligation to, uh, to do recreation. Uh, the recreation center does not meet anyone's needs, hasn't for some time, and, uh, and we need to put it somewhere. And uh, we don't have an, you know, out by the swimming pool, we don't have adequate parking or uh, adequate land to, to build anything that's bigger than we have now. We have a building up here at uh, the Vermont College that is basically the same footprint as our, as our current uh, rec center. So neither one of those is going to work. I think we have to have rec a recreation center right up there. Um, I think we need to have uh, a mix of housing. There are people who just are always going to want to have uh, single family housing. That's the only thing that they're going to uh, to move to. And uh, as I think all three of us probably live in single family housing. I think that, uh, so we're going to have to have some single family housing up there. We're going to have to have uh, clusters and, uh, and townhouse, multi-unit property, because there are plenty of people who also want that. Mm -hmm. But we can have all three of the things we need. Land conservation, outdoor and indoor recreation, and housing. It's a big piece of property, and we can do it. Richard. I voted no on the country club acquisition. Uh, I found it to be land speculation. It had no rationale, and it had no business plan when it was purchased, and that defines land speculation. It still doesn't have a rationale as of today, and it still doesn't have a price tag. And I would like to see both of those prepared by September um, so that we know the total cost of that. And that includes the streets, that includes the street lights, that includes the sewers, that includes the water mains, and that includes land subsidy to the developers if we do, so that we can make an intelligent decision on council in September and not kick it down the road and say, we are going to do this in our capital spending, and we're going to take this projected capital spending on bridges, sidewalks, and the like, and we're going to push it back. But at the same time, on the recreation department, I agree with Jack. It's disgraceful to have the old rec center in Barry that's leaking and the like. But where we disagree is that I would have three alternative site plans by September, one at, at the country club site, the second by Montpelier High School, where it could be used as ancillary gym space during school and where it has ample parking. And the third over at Elm Street by the pool, where we have synergy with other activities of recreation so that we're not held hostage to that one vision. We can still have a recreation center without that project up at, on Country Club Road at the Elks Club. Dan, what do you think? No. Did you hear? Was this an either or? Which which of your? Uh, it's all right. We're, we're, it's 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 very. It's all. It's logical. I'm no, I'm I'm, I, I'm I, you know I, I'm just trying to be clear here. Uh, the I was I, the the original question was your that you both you all have said how you feel about the Country Club Road property and infrastructure. I'm saying that one is an internal focus, which is infrastructure, and one is external. I. My question was, explain why one has to be the priority. Okay. And That's what I thought I heard. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I'm going with the water system. I think uh, you, you don't have a functioning city without a safe water system, and we have a really, really big nut to think. Now, the Country Club Road, I, I'm even further out on that one. I, uh, I was not uh, a supporter. I'm not a supporter now. And given the parcels, rural uh, nature, uh, and it's never been part of the master plan, I think it was a bad choice of public dollars. The water system, we have no choice. We have to start fixing. And right now, we have a system that is not um, designed 
for what it's being demanded to uh, do. Uh, because the water pressure means that the old pipes are popping more often because it was designed for 90 pounds per square inch and what it's getting is 200 plus pounds per square inch. That is um, bad municipal management to allow that happening and that's why we're having uh, pops in the uh, every, you know, there's still one out the door here um, every other week, if not more. Okay, but it's gonna be a big number. Okay, so we need a standard plan of how that we're going to attack that. How are we going to finance it? Who's going to do the work? And I have not seen that forthcoming, and this 50-year plan on the, uh, the water system is a joke, okay? It has, it's a fantasy. It, has, it basically looks like we're going to do the same thing for the next 20 years as we've been doing, which is patching things. And then somehow in 2040, we're going to start finding the financing for the 83 million needed to actually rebuild the system. So that's not a plan. That's a, you know, a pretend. So we're, it's time for us to sort of bite the bullet and start saying what realistically do we have to do with the water system. It is crucial for any city to do it, and I'd rather ride on bumpy roads with good water than uh, uh, to allow that to keep deteriorating the way it is. Final question, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to start with you, Richard. Um, there are a lot of folks in Montpelier who have a lot of different things to say about what they think is wrong. How are you planning on communicating and hearing back and engaging with the community at large? As mayor, you have three responsibilities. I keep going over this. One is you represent the city at meetings and, and events and things like that. Number three, you have accountability and oversight over city management. But the second one is so pivotal, and that's that you are the person who sets the agenda, sets the rules, and chairs the city council meeting. There is nothing worse and demeaning than the two-minute rule, than to go before city council, and the city councilors sit literally above you, and you speak, and they stare at you, and, and they don't respond. Uh, you come to express your opinion and hear what city council has to say, and Bill is the person, our city manager, Bill Fraser, is the person who answers. And basically, you have two minutes, yet what you're talking about is a lot more complex than two minutes. That's simply because city council has always been really poorly run. And it's been poorly run and poorly organized. It doesn't have decisions made in a timely manner. It rambles on and on and on. What I would do is first of all, it's impossible to find on the city site minutes of what was decided at the city council meeting. So basically, I would restructure it so that every item has pros and cons, and that if you want, you will get what the agenda is, along with pros and cons for each item, on the Friday before, and you could submit comment to city council that will be answered at the meeting. And basically, it's a different version so that there is no reason for a two-minute rule, and people can, nuance, in a nuanced way, discuss with city council. It's a communications breakdown. Jan? Um, the mayor uh, has and doesn't rarely, and rarely uses in Montpelier the uh, capacity of being, of mounting the bully pulpit, the place where your voice can be heard uh, broader than just in the council chambers. Richard's exactly right. Uh, the mayor is only a vote in the case of a tie, but it is the, he is or she is the person who can set the agenda. I think the role, if I am elected, I will want to take is a convener, which is to bring together various interests within the city for uh, larger discussions. I would like to offer the uh, city council that option for being able to hear people more clearly on crucial issues rather than having, well, we've got the bureaucratic agenda that Bill's prepared, and we've got this little thing to do here and this thing. And so uh, the city council uh, sessions are basically taken up with uh, the busy business of the city, and it's not actually responding to the people's needs or wants or uh, fears. So I would bring people together around various interests, the housing, uh, the water, the school, 
schools, et cetera, and have them talk and, and talk, have them talk in such a way that the counselors got to hear what they were saying. Because I think what, right now the session, like I said, is busy business. It is not actually taking care of the people's interest or hearing what's going on. And I think the times that we're entering are going to require that kind of approach in a way that we haven't demanded it before. So I uh, would like to see the mayor become uh, the uh, engagement person, the person who's going to bring the city together and start talking about the tough stuff. Jack, you take any exception with anything that's been said? Well, <laughs> what I do, yes. What, what I would say is that the uh, <clears throat> one of the things that, you know, we, we can't say very much good about the uh, pandemic, but one of the things that we can say good is that uh, by opening up to uh, the uh, hybrid meetings of in-person and, and Zoom, we've seen a significant increase in public participation in our, our meetings. And I think that's a good thing. And uh, one thing I've noticed over the years, even before I was on the council, I spent many, many hours, year, week after week, year after year, coming to city council members' uh, meetings to address housing and, and other issues. And one of the things I notice is that if someone shows up to a meeting for, uh, because they're one topic they're interested in, if they stick around, they often find out, well, there's two or three other things they're also interested in, and they stay, and they, they address us about that too. And I think that's a good thing. In uh, Montpelier, we do something that most other towns don't do and uh, are not required, and we're not required to do, which is that we allow members of the public to address us about every single item on the agenda. Most people, uh, most towns, they have a section like uh, our general business and appearances. They take comments from the public, and that's all the public gets to do. Um, I, I do think that we uh, should adjust how we do just general businesses, business and appearances. My proposal uh, earlier this year was to uh, set aside half an hour uh, for that, but allow people to go up to five minutes and assuming there's no mo that wouldn't eat up the entire time. Um, but communication is vital. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. We covered a lot of ground. Um, so now we're going to wrap things up. Um, we're going to, once again, the order you appear in the on the ballot will be how you do your closing remarks. So we're going to start with Dan. We're the, you, have, you have two minutes. Two minute rule. Once again, uh, hi. Uh, and I, I want to offer my compliments to my fellow candidates here who are willing to give their service to Montpelier so that it can be honorably governed. I think it's a big deal. Uh, as you've heard from me tonight, I believe we're at a crucial moment uh, for our city where our old assumptions on the ways of doing things are not sufficient to challenge the, the challenges that are coming our way. Now, such a condition is not new for a state that is famous for not accepting change. But the changes are coming, whether we want them or not. Up until now, most of us have uh, not demanded a robust response to the growing challenges, well, because we tend to assume that tomorrow is going to look much like yesterday. Yet the past few years have shown us that the climate crisis is real, inflation will continue to fray our downtown economy, and our infrastructure is much more fragile than we imagined. Along with that, our assumptions of continued economic growth are uh, preventing us from seeing how the grand plan for such parks and development are assuming tax base that may actually be shrinking. The list of challenges just keeps growing. I hope I can help start actively preparing for tomorrow that doesn't look like yesterday. If we want to keep the key benefits of our little city, then all the growing demands will require shifting our traditional assumptions of stability. It is time for a new, more disciplined approach to the challenges of municipal planning, finance, and governance. My mayoral campaign is aimed at asking such difficult questions about our city's future and about the choices that we should be making. This is hard stuff because it's really about the reality that we're facing rather than the suppositions. We don't see what's clearly coming. I believe that asking these hard questions and exploring with you, the citizens, is going to be a difficult public policy choices that we have to make now for building a humane and resilient future. Thanks. Jack. Thank you. 
Montpelier is now and uh, continues to be a vital community full of engaged, interested people and interesting people. Um, that doesn't mean we, we don't have challenges. We clearly do, and we've touched on a number of them in, uh, in tonight's session. It takes experience and knowledge of, uh, of the situation that we're facing, knowledge of uh, the way government operates to lead us to address those challenges and to lead Montpelier into uh, a thriving future. Based on my years of experience working uh, on a wide range of issues that are facing our city and uh, <clears throat> my ability to work with people in, uh, from every segment of the population, uh, every, uh, every of the ver diverse personalities who, uh, who make up our city government and our city council. I believe that I'm the uh, person uh, to lead Montpelier into the future, and I appreciate uh, the vote of everyone uh, watching us tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Jack. Richard. I thought that Dan's summation was very good about needing a vision. That's Dan's particular forte, and I think he expressed it well. I think that Jack expressed inside understanding of what is right now. I'm going to come in with an outside perspective and say, not dissimilar in a sense to Dan, but my particular management for it is I do understand management. I do understand oversight, and I do understand accountability, and I do understand making hard choices. And I do understand that what is needed right now is to sit and put all of those cards on the table before the next budget session arrives and let's see where they fall. I have no idea what's under those streets, nor does Jack, nor does Dan, nor do you. But everyone deserves to know what's under those streets. When we do construction projects, they're stopped because people don't know where the pipes are. They've never been mapped. We need that kind of understanding and deserve that kind of understanding. I can promise two things as mayor. Water prices are really going to spike no matter which of us is elected mayor. That's a promise. And the second promise is that if we face this, we're not going to like what the, what the experts tell us. But we're all adults, responsible adults, and we deserve to know that so that we can face the future intelligently and strengthen the core of Montpelier, which will strengthen the city that we love, we all love. And I thank Jack, and I thank Dan for running, and I thank you for hosting this, and I thank you for watching. Great. Thank you so much. Um, very good. Thank you again, gentlemen. That was um, a really good discussion, and thank you for joining tonight for what I think was a very informative, um, clear distinction between three individuals who know the city and love the city. Um, Again, the three candidates for mayor are Dan Jones, Jack McCullough, and Richard Shear. Um, a big thank you, big shout out to Orca Media for hosting, um, recording, and rebroadcasting. Um, and three quick reminders for the viewing audience that uh, first, these candidates are going to be meeting one more time, at least one more time, uh, before town meeting day, the Montpelier Rotary Club is hosting a forum Monday, February 27th from 12.30 to 2 p.m. in City Council Chambers at Montpelier City Hall. That actually will be followed by a second forum of the candidates for City Council, which will start at 3. Orca is also, uh, will be there for those forums. Next Thursday, February 23rd, I will be back here from 6.30 to 8, talking to the candidates for the contested races for Montpelier City Council. And that will also be live streamed and available for viewing at Orca Media. Um, lastly, uh, you can get your absentee ballot right now. Um, be sure to get out and vote. The polls will be open on March 7th until 7 p.m. 
and I would urge you to check in with the Times Argus on that evening, and certainly the next day for our extensive town meeting day coverage. And thank you again for tuning in and supporting local journalism and public access. And have a good night.